Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Cole. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I am the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the reading promotion arm. Uh, we promote books and reading and literature across the nation through affiliated state centers for the book. Uh, we also have reading promotion partners around the country. We also are heavily involved in the National Book Festival, which I hope some of you know about. Uh, this year's National Book Festival will be on the National Mall uh, on September the 27th, and we will be having uh, around 60 or 70 authors again. This will be the final year of the Library of Congress's Cooperative Book Festival with Mrs. Laura Bush, who is the person who brought the book festival from Texas to the Library of Congress and asked that we help her go national with this idea, and we've been very pleased uh, to be able to do so. But here at the library, what we do are not only events re related to the book festival, but we also do book talks. And today, of course, we have a book talk about a new book. And I hold up the books because I am a reading promoter. And we are filming this presentation for viewing later on the Library of Congress's and the Center for the Books website. Uh, this series is called Books and Beyond, and it celebrates new books that are on subjects that are related to the Library of Congress, its interests, uh, or its collections. And today, because of the filming of the program, there are a couple of little reminders um, I need to give you. Uh, one is, if you wouldn't mind turning off all things electronic, uh, it will help with the broadcast, the quality of the broadcast. Uh, secondly, there will be time for a question and answer period after Mr. Clymer's presentation. And we hope that you will have questions, but if you choose to ask a question, you in effect are giving the Library of Congress your permission to use your image and your words and your, uh, as part of the program. Uh, for some reason, uh, the books have not yet arrived, but we will hope to have them available in time for the book signing, which will follow the program uh, immediately. We do have a few extra books here at, in any case. Uh, this is an especially interesting topic for those of you who are interested in diplomatic history. Uh, this is called, of course, Drawing the Line at the Big Ditch, the Panama Canal Treaties and the Rise of the Right. Um, our speaker is the uh, former New York excuse me, the former Washington correspondent um, of the New York Times. Uh, he also tells me that because we mentioned in, his, in the press release that he is the author of a biography of Edward Kennedy, that in recent days uh, he's had more questions about Edward Kennedy than he has about, about Teddy Kennedy than he has about the Panama Canal, but we will change that today. Uh, this is a, a book that has gotten excellent reviews. When I first uh, met Mr. Clymer, I recalled seeing uh, some of the reviews and some of the blurbs for the book, and I will just give two to you, and then uh, I will present him. Uh, one, Norman Ornstein, whom some of you may know, and I know Norman, who is a real uh, expert at congressional uh, relations and, and student of Congress, called this a superb book that illuminates and entertains at the same time. Um, Mr. Tom Brokaw calls it a fascinating political whodunit about the place of the Panama Canal in the conservative campaign to sink the ship of congressional liberals. Uh, this is a subject that we will learn more about, uh, and it's my pleasure right now to present our speaker, Adam Clymer, former chief Washington correspondent for the New York Times, who will discuss and sign his book after the question and answers. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks very much, John. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, particularly because I spent a great many hours at the Library of Congress in several, dealing with several of its collections uh, as I did the research on this book. I'll talk a little bit more about that after I explain what the book is about. Um, I'm, I first got interested in the Panama Canal as a kid. Uh, my parents gave me a book called The Book of Marvels by Richard Halliburton. I don't know if any of you ever saw it, but it, it would have a chapter on the, the Sphinx, a, a chapter on the 
modern and ancient marvels all over the world. It had some fascinating stuff about the Mayans uh, that I remember. But, and it had a chapter on the Panama Canal, which described the heroic effort to build it, to, uh, to fight the jungle, to conquer disease, um, the success of the United States when France had failed in this. I, but I think, in fact, the thing I, that struck me the most was that Halliburton swam the 50-mile length of the canal, and uh, he paid a toll based on tonnage of 36 cents, and that's a number that stuck with me. I also covered the debate in the Senate over, ratify, over approving the treaties. Uh, the Senate doesn't actually ratify, although it's a technical consents to the ratification, which is then done by the executive branch. I covered that in 1978, and I uh, went down to Panama when Jimmy Carter signed the final documents that turned it over in, uh, in 1999. And um, I retired from the Times in 2003 and was looking around for a book topic, preferably one that wouldn't take eight years as my biography of Ted Kennedy did. He kept doing more things when I thought I was nearly finished. Um, and uh, this one struck me as interesting because I remembered the, the passions the issue had stirred in the 70s. How you know furious people were at senators who voted for the treaties. And uh, that had seemed to be forgotten in 30 years of smooth functioning of the canal. Uh, none of the, uh, none of the horrible fears that people had had about it being shut down or communists taking over had come true. And, and indeed, when I interviewed people who had been involved in the fight, uh, most of the ones who had been opposed, one or two exceptions, uh, they said, well, it worked out better than we thought. Uh, one, one exception believes that some combination of the Chinese communists and Al Qaeda is about to seize it, but uh, I haven't noticed any evidence to support his theory. Now, the importance of the canal to uh, I'm sorry, the importance of the canal as an issue is really something I discussed in the beginning of the book, and let me just read a small short passage. The conservative movement in America that produced the presidencies of Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush grew out of the ruins of the glorious lost cause of Barry Goldwater in 1964, especially the people drawn into politics to support him at the grassroots. And its intellectual heritage lay in the writings of Friedrich von Hayek, Russell Clark, Kirk, Whitaker Chambers and William F. Buckley, Jr. It st stood for less government, less regulation, lower taxes, and a firm, even pugnacious attitude toward powerful nations, especially communist nations. The movement came to power for many reasons, ranging from the substance of its arguments to the new political involvement of evangelical conservatives to the personal contrast between the optimistic Reagan promising a shining city on a hill to the Jimmy Carter of 1980 who seemed to drift in difficulties. But the occasion of its success was what I consider the generous and wisely self-interested um, decision by the four presidents who came before Reagan that the United States should turn the Panama Canal over to Panama. Um, now, this was never a popular theory. They, there was always a solid majority in public opinion polls against it. And part of the reason is that is experiences like the one I had as a kid reading about it. I mean, American school, I spent a day at uh, Teachers College Columbia, which has, with all due respect to this institution, the best collection of textbooks, school textbooks in the country. Um, and I read, read in 60 or 70 of them the passages that dealt with the canal. And they told of the heroic efforts to build it. Um, they sometimes sneered at the Panamanians as backward, a backward people. They hardly ever said anything about the 
uh, role of the United States Navy in uh, securing the Panamanian Revolution from Colombia in 1903. Um, but there was this generally upbeat tone. I mean, if one, I remember one in particular that said, American pluck and luck conquered all. The waters of the Atlantic and the Pacific were joined. Um, it became really a monument, not that all that many Americans ever saw it, but they saw pictures of it in their school books. Um, and you bring this issue into the 1970s, the mid-70s, when it's finally become clear that the war in Vietnam was a defeat. Uh, we'd been defeated by a small country in Asia, and why should we give up something that we thought of as a national monument to a smaller country in this hemisphere that we had sired or at least midwifed. Uh, so that, that worked hard against any of the efforts made by the various presidents who dealt with the issue uh, to persuade the public to do something about it. And in fact, until Carter, they really didn't do, make much of an effort to persuade the public. Uh, in fact, but the first time that this issue really mattered in American politics came before the presidency of Jimmy Carter. In 1976, Ronald Reagan uh, was running a campaign for president that wasn't going anywhere until he seized on this issue. Uh, it's certainly not the only thing he talked about or the only reason people had for voting for him, but it was a simple direct issue and it kept his campaign alive in 76. Without that, well, I'll talk later about what the consequence of that would have been. It did another thing that was very important and perhaps even less noticed. It won enough seats in the Senate for Republicans who defeated Democrats who had supported the treaty so that when Reagan became president, there was a Republican majority in the Senate. Um, there were at least five seats that turned over on that basis, and the Republicans had, had 52 and one independent voting with them in 1981, so that made the difference between majority and minority status. And finally, it did a great deal for organizations on the right. They raised money, they got members, they got attention. Uh, they were invigorated, it gave them it, g it gave them a cause in the period between elections. Uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, interested uh, many people in the movement who'd probably never thought of themselves as conservative before. Now, the reasons why the United States government, uh, starting with Lyndon Johnson, and continuing through Nixon and Ford, thought it was best to give up control of the canal, were, were simply that they, there was growing tension in Panama, growing objection to what seemed like a colonial relic, uh, anger, particu particularly among students and younger people, but pretty widespread. And the sense was, at the, on this end, that if Panama had a stake in the ownership of the canal, uh, Panama would see to it that it ran. Uh, the government never had any doubts about Panama's ability to run it. Uh, whereas if the United States tried to hold on, the canal would be threatened, uh, threatened with sabotage or some sort of guerrilla warfare. I mean, no one would ever say that the United States Army couldn't have protected it with 100,000 troops or something in the jungle, but we'd lost our appetite for conflict in the jungle after Vietnam. And even, the, even with a huge military presence, it wouldn't take much to knock out one of those locks or to sink a ship in, the, in a lock. There's jungle around. Somebody who was reasonably well-trained with a mortar could probably have closed it, uh, or somebody who'd put a bomb in a ship. Uh, those were the reasons that animated Johnson and Nixon and Ford. Carter added one more, and let me, uh, let me read from it. Um, in an interview, I asked him why, you know, what, did he have any reasons beyond the security reason? And he said, I wanted to treat Panama fairly. I'd studied the issue fairly thoroughly, 
and I was convinced that it was an unfair original agreement that was foisted on the Panamanian people against their will. There was no doubt that I was determined to go through with the Panama Canal because I thought I could succeed, and I did not anticipate the antipathy and the concerted effort that was aroused around the country against it. I underestimated the opposition, and that's an understatement of an underestimation. Um, but Carter did, besides having one additional reason, the, the moral argument for giving up the canal, Carter differentiated himself from his predecessors in one other reason, and that is he took the risk, the political risk, of doing something about it. I think Ford probably would have tried to if he had been reelected, but he'd backed off, he'd put the negotiations in a deep freeze from about Labor Day 1975, once it was clear that Reagan was going to run against him for the nomination. Uh, and Johnson, uh, tr two treaties were negotiated under Johnson, but they were never sent to the Senate, um, and indeed they weren't pushed forward in Panama either. And Nixon really focused, started paying attention to this issue fairly late in his six years in office, probably in about 1973. Carter tried. Uh, now, the arguments for the opposition were that uh, Omar Torrios, the dictator in Panama, was a dictator and his word couldn't be trusted. He was a sort of popular dictator, but he's, he was a dictator. He did lock up people. Uh, he didn't torture them particularly, but uh, and he expelled people from, from the country. Um, there was a fear on the right that Cuba or the Soviet Union would somehow become influential. Um, Torrios uh, got along with Castro, uh, but in fact made a point of saying when he visited Cuba that this was an interesting system for Cuba, but it wouldn't work in Panama. Uh, I think. That, I think the right greatly exaggerated the alleged Cuban influence on him. Um, and finally, and this was perhaps the m most serious argument because it's one that was very hard to d disprove. You either believed it or you didn't. The argument was that if the United States, having lost a war to a tiny country in Asia, allowed another small country to push it around, what would big countries do? Uh, would we seem like a patsy to the world? Ronald Reagan wrote Saul Linowitz, who took over the, the burden of the negotiations when Carter became president, and, and who tried very hard to persuade Reagan to withhold his opposition. He wrote him that surrendering the canal, quote, would be another retreat which would lose the respect of the rest of the world. Um, at any rate, We'll come back to the f what was the first really major political impact of the, of the treaty issue. Ford had been negotiating. The negotiations had been put into a deep freeze during the 76 campaign. But Reagan was aware that negotiations had been going on. Jesse Helms actually had told him about it. Um, and you come to March of 1976, Reagan challenging an incumbent president had thought he could win in New Hampshire and then run the table. Well, in fact, he lost narrowly in New Hampshire and then lost four more primaries in a row uh, and didn't do very well in any of them. He, he gained a bit toward the end in Florida, but by and large, the, the campaign looked uh, on its last legs, not, not just to ordinary newspaper men. It looked that way to Bill Buckley and James Jackson Kilpatrick, two great supporters of his. Uh, John Sears, his campaign manager, was secretly negotiating with the Ford campaign about dropping out. Uh, Nancy Reagan was urging her husband to give it up, that he was being humiliated and to what end. And finally, the campaign was broke. Uh, there, when Ford was, uh, when Reagan was scheduled to come east from Los Angeles to the North Carolina primary in March, his plane sat on the tarmac in that Los Angeles for more than an hour until the airline made sure there was enough money in the till to pay for the charter. Um, 
But when he got to North Carolina, his campaign was, was really reinvigorated, part, partly with the help of, of Helms and some of his aides. Uh, but Reagan had always wanted to do what he'd done in California as governor, which was give speeches, talk, sit at a desk and talk into a camera about what was on his mind. His aides had argued against doing that in the presidential campaign. They thought it would remind people that he'd been an actor, and they didn't want people to be reminded of that. But finally, uh, Helms's people pressed for it, and Reagan wanted to do it, so Sears and company gave in. And they created a half an hour television tape. They really created it out of a speech he had given in Florida. Uh, a Florida station had offered him and Ford a half an hour of time to do anything they wanted with. Ford didn't accept it, but Reagan gave a speech. Uh, they edited the speech uh, for North Carolina. They took out the palm trees and they put in an address to send donations to. But it was a long speech, mostly about foreign policy. Um, and uh, it stressed very heavily, or at least part of what, what came through, uh, was the Panama Canal argument within it. Um, he also combined it with a stump speech in which he unveiled the slogan, we bought it, we built it, it's ours, and we're going to keep it, uh, or sometimes embellished with uh, calling Torrios a tinhorn dictator or a friend of Castro, but that was a a slogan that worked, dominated his stump speeches. Uh, he worked hard all over the state. That TV speech was shown on all but a couple of the stations. Uh, the American Conservative Union bought ads to tell people when and where they could watch the speech. Um, the impact of it was, was, was interesting, and I'll do one last reading from the book at this point. An aide of his named Charlie Black, who had worked for Helms, he was a noted native North Carolinian. He's now essentially the chief strategist for John McCain's campaign. But Charlie explained why this seemed to work. He said, there were a lot of elements in Reagan's policy, but that was the most emotional. Trying to educate people about Helmut Sonnenfeld and Kissinger giving up on Eastern Europe, most people couldn't remember much about that. But they could try to do something about keeping the canal, and that was vote for Reagan. Uh, and it worked. And people who talked, there weren't really very good exit polls taken, but people who, who talked to voters about why they were voting, reporters and campaign people, heard a lot about that. Well, winning North Carolina put the campaign back on its feet. Uh, he followed that up with a national speech on television, which was more or less the same, the same thing with, with a fundraising appeal. It made no news. It was dismissed by the Ford campaign because it had low ratings. Uh, but it raised a lot of money. Uh, the, um, the North Carolina primary, he won by about 10 points, to, to his great surprise. Um, and then he followed that up by winning all the delegates in Texas, all the delegates in Georgia and Alabama, uh, talking constantly about the canal issue, uh, and drew very close. At one point, the New York Times delegate count, I wasn't working for the Times then, I was working for the Baltimore Sun, had him ahead. He didn't win. Ford had, uh, had things going for him, too. I mean, as an incumbent, the most dramatic of them was that he invited wavering delegates to sit with him on the flight deck of the USS Farstall. This was on the 4th of July celebrations in New York Harbor and watched the tall ships sail by. You know, that, uh, that was persuasive. Uh, but the result of it was that Reagan came out of the 1980 campaign, especially because of a dramatic and very effective speech he gave at the convention a slightly rewritten version of the acceptance speech they had drafted just in case they managed to get through and win the nomination. Um, and he emerged from the campaign of 1976 as the front runner for 1980. Even, even if Ford had defeated Carter, and he nearly did, he would have been ineligible to serve another term because uh, that would have led him to surpass the 10-year limit put in and, after uh, after the war. Uh, well, 
It, and the Panama Canal issue conveyed Reagan's overall argument about the U.S. decline in a way that talking about the SALT treaties or arguing about whose missiles were bigger never could. This, this one reached people. I'll come back to that. But, well, if Reagan had not seized on this issue effectively, had not managed to win North Carolina, I think he would have never been come close to Ford. Uh, and if he hadn't, he might have stayed on, limped on, uh, but he would have been seen as an irrelevancy, or if he had dropped out early. Uh, would he have run again? Uh, he, the what-ifs of history are, are not answerable. I mean, some of his, some of his uh, colleagues, Peter Hannaford, an advertising man, and Dick Worthlin, his pollster, thought he would not. Paul Laxalt, his closest friend in the Senate, thought he would not. Some others, Mike Deaver, another advertising man, and Stuart Spencer, a sometime campaign manager, said, oh, yeah, he'd have tried again, and he'd have won. Um, I asked Nancy Reagan, and she said, well, they never talked about it, uh, so she really, and she really didn't have any idea what he would have done. Uh, that sounds like Reagan. Reagan was never one giving given to looking backwards. Uh, the thing was over, he wouldn't worry about it. My own opinion is that no, uh, he, would have, he wouldn't have run again, and that even if he had, uh, it would have been a very hard thing for him to succeed because a bad defeat in 1976 would have been taken by a lot of people the way the Goldwater defeat was taken, as evidence that someone that conservative couldn't win. I don't mean that the conservatives would never have nominated and elected the president, but it would have taken longer than 1980. Uh, now, the issue did more, you know, preserving Reagan as a candidate for 1980 is a pretty hefty claim on political importance right there, but the issue did a lot more. Um, it sometimes, I often thought it persuaded people they were conservative who'd never thought about it because people didn't want to give up the canal. And if they were told that conservatives were against giving up the canal, well, then maybe they were conservatives themselves. Um, the conservative organizations, which had a lot of rival, personal rivalries, worked together pretty well on this because there, there was enough money, there was enough attention to go around. They collaborated. Um, human events, this weekly, which I love because it's one of only two publications that's reviewed my book so far. <laughs> human Events liked it, National Review didn't, but uh, the Human Events guy knew more about it. Um, they crusaded in the, in the way that American mainstream newspapers used to crusade, crusade. If any of you remember the effort that Pulitzer's New York World and Hearst's New York American put into stimulating the war of, of uh, the Spanish-American War, uh, they were doing their best at human events. And in fact, they broke some news um, in trying to persuade Panama to go along with the treaty. Uh, they had to have a referendum, and they had to have a two-thirds majority to get it. One of Panama's treaty negotiators stretched the truth or lied about what the treaty allowed the United States to do. He was saying, no, it doesn't give them the power to send uh, ships to the head of the line. It doesn't give them any power to intervene if the canal is threatened. Only if we ask them can they come in. Well, that wasn't what the treaty said. Uh, but human events publicized it, and the mainstream press largely ignored it, at least until senators started asking questions about it. Um, for the conservative organizations, there's a man you probably, most of your name will remember him. I always used to call him the postmaster general of the new right, Richard Vigory. And he told me that the canal, it was a big part of our agenda. If there was one issue more than any other that gave impetus and unity to the conservative movement, it was the Panama Canal issue. Now, one of the organizations that didn't depend on Vigory was the American Conservative Union. They worked together, but uh, it wasn't like some other organizations that he had helped create, like the National Conservative Political Action Committee. The, uh, the ACU was really the leader in this. It did 
one unique thing for which we we can remember it to our pleasure or ill. It invented the infomercial. Now, you, some of you, if you can't sleep and you switch on the television at 2 a.m., you will be treated to a half an hour of explaining how you can have flat abs in three minutes a day or, you know, cure male pattern baldness or all sorts of other wonderful things. Well, infomercials for commercial products really didn't start being shown until the 80s when the FCC changed the rules about how much commercial content could be on the air. But the ACU ran a program uh, for a half an hour. They showed it on more than 200 stations. About 9 million people saw it. It showed pictures of the canal and graphics of the canal in operation. And Phil Crane, a congressman from Illinois, Republican, who was the chairman of the American Conservative Union, played host. He would introduce, you know, four senators, a couple of leaders of veterans organizations, a retired canal zone judge, to talk about as what he called the American Canal at the Isthmus of Panama. And uh, after each of them finished speaking, he asked people to pledge at least ten dollars so that this program could be shown more places and so the ACU could lead the fight against the canal. Uh, that was shown more than 200 times. Nine million people saw it. It raised about a quarter of a million dollars profit for the ACU. The other piece of the campaign that was probably even more important, uh, though it's a little harder to measure and visualize, opponents of the treaty sent out at least 10 million pieces of direct mail. Uh, and it was particularly effective than a lot of other mailings, sort of a general, I mean, on one occasion, Vigory had sent out 20 million letters for a crusade against pornography. Uh, that didn't do nearly as well as the canal letters, because in the canal letters, there was something for people to do. They could write their senator and say, don't vote for the treaty or I'll never vote for you again. Uh, and in that sense, it was effective. Now, the Wright's efforts were not effective in defeating the treaties. Each of them passed with a single vote to spare in the Senate. And my book really doesn't do a deal in great detail with the fight to ratify the treaties. That's been done. Uh, George Moffat's has a book. It's out of print, but it's an excellent book describing that. And former Ambassador Bill Jordan uh, wrote a book from the State Department or the embassy's perspective on it. But the ha having the treaties passed wasn't the end of the world for the conservative movement because they, while they honestly thought the treaties were bad for the United States, they thought the issue was good for them. Gary Jarman, the legislative director of the American Conservative Union, once said, conservatives see this as a great opportunity to take control of the Republican Party. They had something of a hit list, a number of senators. Most of all, if he ended up voting for the treaties, and at the time they were putting this list together, they weren't sure, Howard Baker of Tennessee, the Senate minority leader. Um, Baker did something that I never saw on another occasion in four decades of covering Congress. Here was a plausible presidential candidate. Now. Senators these days see a plausible presidential candidate every morning when they, sh when they shave or these days when they put on their lipstick. Uh, but Baker was, uh, Baker was plausible beyond his own bathroom. Uh, he was treated that way by political writers, and most of all, he was feared by the Carter administration as a very tough opponent if he got the Republican nomination in 1980. Well, here you have this fellow, and he hired a man named Jim Cannon, who had worked for Rockefeller and Ford, to work for him in the Senate, but basically to lay the groundwork for a, for a run for president. And Cannon told him, uh, if you support the treaties, the Republicans will not nominate you. And they both recall that Baker had a three-word response, which was, so be it. I can't do my job as a senator if I'm always going to be looking over my shoulder. Um, the Senate, and so, you know, I admire Baker for that, and indeed, so did a number of other people uh, who voted the other way, Barry Goldwater, for example. 
Um, their hope, the rights hoped that the Senate would become more conservative, and the, especially the Republican Party in the Senate and nationally would become more conservative, was not realized so much by defeating the senators, the Republican senators who had supported the treaty. Several of them lost. Uh, in none of those cases did I think that the treaty was a great issue, and one or two may not have run because they expected serious opposition from it, although I'm not, not sure of that. The, the issue transformed the Senate in a different way. The Republican senators defeated, Republican candidates defeated Democratic senators who had voted for the treaties. They probably defeated about 20 of them. Four or five of them five of them actually, I would say the issue of the canal was determinative. That is, if the canal issue had never come up or if the Democrat in question had voted against the treaties, he would have survived. And now I don't want to talk about all of them in great detail. The best, the, the first and the most dramatic single example probably was Tom McIntyre of New Hampshire. Uh, McIntyre was a World War II military hero. He'd won three times in a, what was then a very Republican state. Um, he had a, a, while he was an Irish uh, Irishman, he was, uh, he had the personality really of a wasp New Englander. He was taciturn, he was frugal. Uh, and he knew that there was a lot of opposition to the Canal Treaty in New Hampshire, stirred up by the Manchester Union leader, one of the two or three worst newspapers in the country at the time. Uh, there were papers in Indianapolis and Phoenix that competed. Um, and uh, by the Conservative Caucus. Uh, and the day of the first Senate vote, he said he was in his office and he said to his wife, Myrtle, come on and watch me lose my seat. Um, he was defeated by Gordon Humphrey, a co-pilot for Allegheny Airlines. Uh, who just recently moved to New Hampshire and ran uh, because of the canal, because he didn't think anyone else in the Republican Party was going to make that a central issue if they ran against McIntyre. Uh, Terry Dolan of the National Conservative Political Action Committee, Nick Pack, came up to help, uh, to help the campaign. Uh, the union leader uh, hammered uh, McIntyre on that subject and on anything else it could think of. Um, and Humphrey told me it was a make or break issue for me and for McIntyre. You know, I won by about half a percent in that first race. So it was a pretty, pretty close contest, and that issue cut more for us than did any other. Another thing that might be said of that race is, is Humphrey worked a lot harder than McIntyre did. Humphrey never took a day off but one. He did take a day off to get married in the middle of the campaign, but he went back out and campaigned the next day. Uh, and McIntyre was one of those senators who thought he had done well in the Senate, done well by his state, and people ought to recognize that. And he didn't spend as much time as an incumbent would today protecting his flanks. Uh, moreover, Humphrey used Boston television on Dolan's advice, and McIntyre who had never used it before didn't use it again, didn't use it that time, and that might have made a difference. Um, another race in 1978, Iowa, Roger Jepson defeated Dick Clark. No question that abortion was a bigger issue in that campaign than the canal, but the, it was a narrow loss, and I think the canal, I've seen some polling data that suggests that without the canal issue, Clark could have got through. Now you come to 1980, and if you read most of the press, you didn't think the Panama Canal mattered. In part, that was because Reagan and Carter never much talked about it. Indeed, Reagan had not made nearly as much of a fuss about it in when the treaties were actually before the Senate as he had in 1976. He spoke against it, but he didn't lead the charge. Uh, and the reason for that is kind of interesting. Saul Lenowitz and Ellsworth Bunker went to see him after the treaties had been finally negotiated in August of 1977, and they tried to persuade him not to oppose the treaties, that it was necessary to give the canal away in order to save it and use it. Reagan wasn't persuaded, but 
when they left, he turned to Nancy and to Pete Hannaford, and he said, what if they're right? And that nagging doubt of his didn't keep him from speaking against the treaties, but kept him from taking a leading role. When the second, treaty, second of the two treaties was finally ratified in April of 1978, he was in Japan. He was told about it in a car with some aides. He swore for a few minutes. And then he got out of the car, met some reporters, and said, I hope my misgivings will not be realized. But it did matter in Senate races in 1980. And those didn't get much attention, as Senate races usually don't in a presidential year. They get covered a bit in the places like the Times and the Post, but not by the chief political reporters who are busy covering the presidential race, and frequently by regional reporters so that there's no one person seeing a trend. I think there were three, three issues, three states in particular where it mattered. One was North Carolina, a college professor, pretty good teacher by all accounts, very conservative, named John East basically a creature of the Helms organization, ran against Robert Morgan. And his whole campaign was on television, and 90% of his ads were about the canal. Um, East had had polio while serving in the uh, Marine Corps. One survey after the election r revealed that most North Carolinians didn't know that he uh, uh, had to use a wheelchair. He was personally unknown, but the ads, the ads mattered. And Helms helped out. He brought in race and religion uh, as well, uh, infuriating Morgan by suggesting that he wasn't a good Christian. But uh, another race where it mattered uh, was uh, was Idaho. Frank Church was basically pretty, t basically more liberal than Idaho on a lot of scores. He'd been there for four terms, longer, seeking a longer term than anyone had ever had before. And he had managed the treaties on the floor of the Senate. Now, there were other things people had against him, but the uh, NICPAC, National Conservative Political Action Committee, started hammering him in ads, which were very cheap in Idaho, long before he had an opponent, Steve, eventually Steve Sims, a congressman. And the, uh, they kept on, over the final weekend, they had a little money left in their account, and they showed a 15-second ad over and over and over again where Don Todd, the head of their Idaho operation, said into the camera, now that all the shouting's over, remember the Panama Canal. Built with American blood and treasure, Frank Church voted to give it away. Finally, one, one last race, which I hadn't thought of at first, and most of the conservatives I talked to never claimed, but Jimmy Carter told me about it, and that was Talmadge's race for re-election in Georgia. Now, Talmadge, too, had other bigger problems, uh, a messy divorce, a messy treatment for alcoholism, and being denounced by the Senate, 81 to 15, for pocketing cash and not reporting expenses and generally uh, doing well by, for, doing at least as well by himself as he was doing for Georgia. Um, his opponent, Matt Mattingly, uh, got a lot of help from the Republican National Committee because they thought Talmadge was vulnerable on these other issues, and they were right. Uh, but the, um, he had one, he used it a bit on the stump, he used it in ads, and then he had one other tactic. He would go around to small towns and he'd tack a list of questions on a door, not, not as many as Martin Luther, but... Uh, <laughs> I think, I think it was usually 23, and he put these on a door or a bulletin board and said, now, don't you all let Herman Talmadge come through here without answering these questions. I'd have asked him in a debate, but he won't debate me. Well, the key one, and the one that small town papers picked up, was why did you vote to give away the Panama Canal? And that cut into Talmadge's traditional strength in the small towns, and in a narrow race made the difference. More generally about 1980, it had coattails. Reagan had coattails that hadn't been seen since 1964 and hadn't been seen since. They picked up more than 30, I think 36 seats in the House. And in the Senate, they took 12 Democratic held seats and had a majority for the first time since the 50s. Uh, they weren't all very distinguished candidates. In fact, 
when a lot of them lost in 1986, Bob Dole said, you know, if we'd known we were going to take control, we'd have run better candidates in 1980. <laughs> um, but they got to 53 with this independent in the Senate, and Howard Baker, ironically, became the majority leader. Howard Baker became majority leader because of the five new, new senators, Gordon Humphrey, Roger Jepson, John East, Steve Sims, and Matt Mattingly, who had defeated Democrats over the canal issue, Democrats who had voted exactly the way Baker had on the canal. Uh, without them, Roger, Robert Byrd would still have been the majority leader. Well, why does that matter? Sometimes when you look at the Senate and the anarchy that describes its procedures, you just say, well, inaction is its default mode, and it doesn't much matter who's in charge. That seems to be true these days. The Democrats have enough senators to stop anything the Republicans want, and the Republicans have enough to stop anything the Democrats want, and relatively little happens. Well, a majority leader is important, though. He controls one thing. One of the few things that is controllable in the Senate is the schedule of which bills come up. And the majority leader decides which come up and when, and which never do. Uh, another reason why a majority matters is that committee chairmen have some clout. And Strom Thurmond was a lot more sympathetic to Reagan's judicial nominees than Joe Biden or Ted Kennedy would have been. Bob Dole was a lot more supportive of his tax cuts than Russell Long would have. And they have some clout. Jim Baker, who was Reagan's first chief of staff, told me, Having a Senate majority made all the difference in the world in getting the 1981 Reagan economic program through the Congress. The other thing, and Reagan understood this, you come move forward to 1982, there's a recession on, uh, everyone is predicting a good year for the Democrats, but Dick Worthland told him there's an 80 percent chance the Republicans would hold the Senate, though they would lose anywhere between two and four dozen seats in the House. And Reagan wrote in his diary that night, it will be disastrous if we don't. Now, more looking back on the impact of the canal and the politics it spurned, some of the things are tactics that are with us today. The first independent spending ever done under the 1972 and 74 campaign acts and Supreme Court decisions was done by the American Conservative Union, which spent $16,000 to help Reagan on the canal issue. Now, that's dwarfed, of course, by what the millions that MoveOn.org and Swift Boat Veterans for Truth and a bunch of others spent 2004, and who knows what's going to be spent this year. Uh, another thing, legacy of this movement, is the early attack ads. Now the congressional committees start picking on potentially weak incumbents three months after they've been elected, uh, long before their parties have any idea who's, who it is who's going to run against them. Another thing that's obvious, uh, of course, you like it or not, no one would doubt that the Reagan presidency was of considerable significance in American history. Um, beyond that, there are some other things. The, the time of a willing bipartisanship in foreign policy may not have absolutely died, but it was underwater for a long time after the canal. Even Baker, a few months after leading the canal to victory, uh, was hoping to ride opposition to the SALT Treaty to the presidency and, and said that the era of politics stopping at the water's edge, the era of Vandenberg cooperating with Truman, that was well and good in its time, but it, its time was past. So, not only is the United States, by any measure, a more conservative country today, it's also one where political consensus and middle ground are hard to find. The Panama Canal no longer divides Panama in two, but the fissures that opened three decades ago have widened and they help divide the United States. Thank you. Good. Let's. If anyone's got got any, just ask you to repeat the question. Yeah, yes. Adam, I, uh, Pat Towell, I, I was covering uh, the Senate for CQ when you were there. But my worst nightmare was that I'd be covering a story that Adam was also covering. Was well, you had a weekly at that point only, yeah. so that was a disadvantage. And happily, my I, I wasn't the prime on the I was the, the backup on the canal. But I wonder if my impression.
question is that part of the way that, that Carter lumbered the canal was not only that he added that moral that, that moral dimension, which came off, I think, as a moralizing dimension, but, but that his we were far enough into his administration by then that a perception was forming that he was just, you know, a, 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 uh, a moralizer in, in the context of foreign affairs. Surely two years on, by the time we got into Salt II, which I did cover, that, yeah, I mean, it was quite clear that the merits of the treaty, whether we were better off with or without the treaty, as, as Harold Brown kept putting it, the, the point was that nobody trusted this man to, to, to deal with our relationship with the Soviet Union, and it was this sense that he was just, he was incapable of being demon. If, if, if Carter had been content to stick with the, the sort of security-based argument for the for the, tr the canal, you know, the canal's more secure if we give the Panamanians a state. If he'd been content to leave it with that and not get into the psalm singing and so forth, do you think it would have made a difference? It's a question from Pat Towell, who covered the Senate for Congressional Quarterly when I was there. Um, and he asks if, if the moralizing from Carter made a difference and made it harder for him to get the treaties through. I don't think, in fact, he did much public moralizing on the canal issue. He did a bit. I mean, what he said to me, and I quoted, is a little more blunt than anything he ever said at the time. I don't think so, because I think the opposition had little to do with him, but with giving up this American monument and signifying weakness. I think that would have... I mean, that's what Ford feared, and, and and why Johnson. One reason why Johnson never pursued it, and I think, I think that was a given. I think Carter exagger overestimated his ability to persuade people. I mean, there was a certain tendency of Carter to think of himself as perhaps the smartest man in the room, and if he understood something, well, he'd just explain it, and everyone else would agree with him. Uh, in fact, one of the things that happened when they. F at first, their theory was that they could persuade the American public that this was a good idea, and the polls would change. And as Hamilton Jordan rather injudiciously said, uh, some of these bastards won't do anything but vote their mail. If we change their mail, we'll change their vote. Whatever the merits of that argument, it wasn't a good thing to get in print. Um, and they can, once it became clear that the public wasn't shifting on the issue, uh, they started working on elites. They would ask senators who, would who they thought would like to be with them, well, who can we bring in from your state who matters in terms of making opinion? And they'd bring in newspaper editors and lawyers and bankers and union leaders, and they'd have a couple of hundred people from a state, and one of the, usually the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and Carter, and Vance or Brzezinski, and a bunch of people would speak to them, and they'd get punch and cookies, and they'd be impressed, and they would write letters. I've seen a lot of the letters in the Carter Library. I was against it when I came there, but you persuaded me. And that degree of several hours of impact, which was available to opinion leaders, but not something the American public was going to engage in, uh, made it easier for senators to vote for it. Another thing that's different, I think, there were Frank Church and Tom McIntyre are two people I know who thought that voting for the treaties could well cost them their jobs. They weren't certain that it would, and they both went back to the states, states and tried, despite the advice of their campaign managers, to convince people that it had been a good idea, thereby bringing the issue up again when it probably was a, a bad tactic. Uh, but there were probably some more who felt that way. Uh, and I'm not sure that we could find four or five senators today who would vote on a tough issue in a way that they expected to cost them their ne next election. Uh, that's too bad. Another question? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, question about Reagan. And why is it that when he uh, came to office, he didn't uh, try to do something about Well, he dis he, the question is, why didn't Reagan, once he took office, try to do something about the 78 treaties? 
I think the answer, first of all, he disappointed a number of conservatives by not doing it. But basically, it was, this was no longer a real big problem. Uh, nothing had happened bad in, in a couple of years since the treaties. He had r the Soviet Union and China and Congress to contend with on a variety of things. Reagan didn't go looking for problems, and he didn't spend much time looking backwards. If something bad had happened, he'd have faced it. You know, the canal had been shut down. I'm sure he would have used the treaty's power to send troops in. But uh, Reagan, Reagan looked forward, not back. Another? Yes, sir. Given this background and the fact that the other presidents had shirked this responsibility, what was the pressure on uh, Carter to not do this, to, to, to you know, just pass it off until 1981, when, when he got reelected, to take on this burden, rather than with the inflation and gas lines and abortion issue, now, now give this issue to the uh, Congress to have to carry? Um, a lot of people in Congress wished he would have done that and said so at the time. Uh, I think the reason was fairly simple. This issue was teed up and ready to be dealt with when he took office. Uh, the Panamanians were pushing for the resumption of the talks that had been frozen by Ford. Uh, a lot of his advisors were persuaded of the, of the menace to the canal and figured, th and figured that you could, you had to start doing something before it was somebody overtly tried to sabotage it. Because if you try, if you waited until then, you could never get something through the Senate. We'd be bowing in the in the face not merely of threats but of, of some hostile action. Um, and once again, they were assured by their pollster, the Honorable Cadell, that. Uh, now, people didn't really care that much about the canal. Yes, they were against giving it away, but uh, it uh, it wasn't a big deal to them. Uh, they misread the politics of it. Uh, and once once having committed to negotiate, I, you know, I think uh, once again they were persuaded that since it made such good sense to them, they could persuade the American people of it. I think backing off once you had signed the treaties. Uh, would certainly have made him seem seem weak. I think the uh, the argument was really he shouldn't have negotiated them. Uh, the same sort of thought came up in the Ford administration. Kissinger kept urging Ford, well, we could negotiate them and you know just keep it secret and not uh, not send the treaties to the Senate until after the election. Uh, Kissinger's political instincts were not all they could be at that. The idea that a treaty could have been negotiated and kept secret uh, is beyond belief. Um, so um, I think basically it was Carter's confidence that he could sell the public on it. Yes, sir. Following up on that, uh, there were reports out of Panama, and I don't know what the intelligence was, but I think it was the day after the treaty was ratified, the New York Times reported that the Panamanian, that the Panamanian government had planned to sabotage the canal if the treaty had not been ratified. Right. And this may have played into the Carter administration uh, decision no. that they had to move forward. Right. Well, as when the first of the two treaties came up in March, there were intelligence reports to that effect. And they managed to send planes and troops down to Panama in considerable numbers without anybody reporting it. Uh, they kept them there for the month or so until the next treaty was passed with the same fear. Uh, Torrios actually told a press conference the night of ratification or early the next morning that he would have sent forces in to attack the canal if the treaty had been defeated. 
Uh, and the intelligence was, yes, that's what he intended to do. Now, we had troops there. We might very well have stopped them. I don't know. I haven't. I never got any CIA stuff on through Freedom of Information Act and doing this research, but maybe it'll come in another 10 or 20 years. Yes, ma'am. It's ironic to me that some 10 years later we went to send a Panama in. Uh, it's a whole other story, isn't it? It is. Uh, we went in to take out Noriega, who had been Torrio's intelligence chief, who had who had been used to intimidate Baker and Chafee and Garn when they went down by explaining how vulnerable the canal was and how the only thing that was protecting it were his forces, uh, and who was widely suspected uh, as the author of the air airplane crash which killed Torrios and enabled Noriega, not immediately but soon thereafter, to come to power. A, a nasty piece of work. I don't see any more, so thank you. Well, I would like to thank Mr. Clymer for sharing his reporting skills, uh, his narrative skills, and his general political understanding of a of a event that has taken place not so well many years ago in our history uh, with all of us. He really has explained it well, and uh, he does so in the book. However. I have to apologize. We failed to straighten out an earlier mix-up on the books, and we do not have any books here for sale. And I am very sorry. I apologize to our speaker. This has happened three times in the 90 book talks that you will see up on our website. And I'll make the same offer today that I have before. If someone, and we tried hard just a few minutes ago to get the books at the Trover shop, and they're not there either. Now, maybe that's a good sign. I don't think so. but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but if anyone uh, would like to uh, buy the book and get it to us, I will certainly uh, be in touch with Mr. Clymer and have him back here again uh, and get some, some of the books signed and mail them back out to you. And I have my cards, and we will be happy to do that service. But uh, it's one of those things that just happened to slip out of our control, and we were unable to correct it, and I apologize again. Uh, please uh, join me one more time in thanking Adam Clymer for a wonderful job.